So in one of my last videos, I talked about the dangers of implosion from a Miss Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. How all the press releases, there's a danger that it's starting to go to her head and that she's going to, you know, start to believe her own press reports and become insufferable. Now, this actually happened to you too. I remember this phenomenon well. In the final analysis, okay, U2 is actually a really good band. They have some really good songs. All is quiet on New Year's Day. The world is wise in some new way. And I want to be with you, be with you night and day. That's a great song. You got to, cause it's too late, too night. To drag the past out into the light. That's one. That's a great song. You got a lot of really good, solid U2 songs. Uh, that was one New Year's Day. So in the final analysis, they're actually a really good band. But there was a time where I actually used to deeply resent them because they became insufferable. A little bit their fault because they played along with the press reports. But in the media, this was somewhere in the beginning of the 90s, mid-90s, around the time of Rattle and Hum. The media started to talk about them like they were the second coming of the Beatles, or even worse, second coming of the Clash. Honestly, the media would talk about them like, yeah, I, I consider the Clash one of the great bands, and actually so does Bono. I've heard him talk about this. They, you two, you might not know this, started by the first thing, thing that got them, gave them the impulse to start a band was they saw the Clash play at King's College in Dublin, 1976. I believe those are the exact dates, and that's exactly where they saw them. You can look, uh, I, didn't, I didn't look it up, but I'm pretty sure that's where, where it happened. They did see the Clash play when they were young. And Bono will be the first to tell you, this redeemed him a lot in my eyes, because I think Bono understands his place in the pantheon of, pantheon of rock divinity. And he'd be the first person to tell you that they are not the Ramones, and they are not the Clash. They're a really solidly good band, though. They're kind of like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They're a really good, solid, second-tier band. They aren't the Rolling Stones, they aren't the Beatles, and they aren't the Clash. Yes, I put the Clash in that category. And, by the way, so does Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone had a top 500 albums of all time. They gave London Calling number five. Number five. I mean, that may have changed. I'm going back 10 years when I read it, but I don't think it's changed. If it's changed, they bumped it down like number nine. So I put the Clash very high up there as a band like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. You may disagree with me, you know, you shouldn't. <laughs> Go listen to London Calling. I think that's the best rock album of the past, since of the rock and roll era. I think that's the best album, actually. But any, anywho, so where am I going with this? There was a time where they became insufferable, where the press was talking about them like they were the second coming of the Clash, and they started to talk about themselves in the same way, that they were, they were the, 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 the next great thing. They were the greatest thing since sliced bread, and if you don't believe it, get out of their way because you just don't understand the movement. Now, that's a little bit how Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is starting to see herself today. That same phenomenon started to happen to Barack Obama. That's when he first appeared on the horizon. A lot of people don't remember this now because, you know, he became president. And we just sort of dealt with him as he was. But when he first appeared on the horizon, the press reports about him were through the roof. You know, I remember my sister came out to California and I... And, we used to get in these arguments about politics or discussions, well, arguments, discussions, whatever you want to call it. And I, I said, you know, he's not JFK meets Martin Luther King Jr. You know, meets Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> if he ever becomes that, I'll let you know. But he's not that. And that's how he was being talked about. Like, there was a time when like, he went to Germany. and it, I forget if he, where did he speak? Before the Brandenburg Gate, I think. And I don't know. It was out of control for a while there. People were starting to to talk about him like he was the second coming of either JFK or FDR or Abraham Lincoln. People forget that now because he became president and brought him down to earth to, to a certain degree. But also, I don't think the press reports, he sort of handled the press reports in stride. He did not, it went to his head a little. It didn't go to his head a lot and completely discombobulate him and destroy him and force him to implode. It went to YouTube, U2's head a lot. They got over it, but for a while there, they were insufferable. They were playing right along with the press releases, talking about, kind of inferring that they were the greatest thing since sliced bread, and they were the clash, and they, you know, if you didn't understand. Now, Alexandria Orca Orcasio-Cortez is young. 
okay? When you are young, revolutionary fervor is part of being young. It's part of the process. So it's possible she will get over it too and she will grow out of it. The Clash sometimes talk like that too. You know, we're here to burn the whole city down and if you don't understand us, you don't understand the movement. That's part of being young. You're going to set the world on fire. Your revolutionary fervor is in your blood, especially you're a you know, punk rock young man. You know, they come to you, put a camera in front of you, put a microphone in front of your face, and you've been salivating, chomping at the bit to, to speak your piece. So the first thing you start saying is how we're going to burn your town down and we're here to set the world on fire. And if you don't understand us, get out of the way. She's got a little bit of that. And I guess it makes her charismatic to a certain degree. I'm just telling you there's a danger to that. That's what I was trying to say in one of my last videos. There is a danger to that. You go too far with it, and like you two, you become insufferable. There was a time where I couldn't even look at you two. I couldn't listen to them on TV. I, I started to resent their music. Now, the final analysis, like I said, you two is actually a really good band. But there was a period there for about six or seven years where they were literally unbearable. I couldn't stand them. I couldn't stand, they were insufferable. I wouldn't read their articles. I wouldn't, because the press wasn't completely their fault. The press adulation was out of control. The danger, and this danger is real for Ocasio-Cortez, and it was real for Obama, and he didn't completely yield to it. He yielded to it a little. The danger is you start to believe your own press reports. The press adulation is out of control and off the charts, and you start going, yes, that's me. I really am the greatest thing since sliced bread. I really am Freddie Mercury, the politician version. <laughs> That's what you start to say to yourself. And that voice is dangerous. It starts to play at you. It starts to tell you, and you surround yourself with sycophants. And, you know, the road to ruin is obvious. The road to ruin, as far as I'm concerned, is completely obvious. So we'll see if it happens in her, in her case. Like I said, as I game it out right now, looks like it will. That's how I game it out right now. Now, she's young, she could grow out of it, and it could just be the revolutionary fervor of youth. Because there is something fun and exciting about, you know, taking no prisoners when you're young. When you start to, when you start to get old and talk like that, people think you're a moron. <laughs> when you're young, everyone's like, yeah, cool, set the world on fire. You know, when you're, when you're over the age of 35, you talk like that, people think you're an idiot. So we'll see. She's still young, she's still got time, grow out of it, get a grip, come down to earth, and maybe be an effective politician. Um, we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. You let me know, you know, a politician's not a rock star. That's another thing. It's a lot more forgivable than a rock star. Ultimately, a congressman is like, so what? Who, what congressman sets the world on fire and how? <laughs> because I joined the, the Armed Forces Committee and I'm passing this and I'm putting this bill down. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, a rock star is a lot more immediate. You said you put a Clash album on and yeah, it sounds like they are setting the world on fire. That's part of why you do it. It's part of a game, a pose. But, you know, a congressman starts doing it. How's the congressman set the world on fire? How exactly does that work? It doesn't really, you know. So, I don't know. We'll see. You let me know. Is I game it out now? She is heading, it looks to me like she is potentially heading towards implosion. What do you think? Do you have an opinion? Let's hear it. Anywho, that's all for now. Amen, kids.